morning, everybody. Good morning. When I came here before to speak the other day, I said, so far, so good, and I would now say, so far, so great. Um, this has been a, yeah? Um, this has been really a very exciting weekend for all of us. It's coming to a close soon, but uh, I think we're going to probably have more jammed in this morning than we can imagine. This morning's speaker, the first one is Yaakov Malkin, and to really mimic what Dan Friedman said yesterday, we've already met him, and you already know about him because you've already heard him speak, and he's already told you his personal story of his parents, uh, and some of their background, some of the tensions in the family, Zionist and Yiddish backgrounds. Um, Yaakov was born in Warsaw, and then moved as a young child to Israel, and he said to me, Palestine, Israel, he said to me that he is a third generation atheist, um, <laughs> at least, um, on his grandfather's side, one grandfather's side, although apparently he became a Chabadnik at some point. No, one of my, my grandfather. Yeah, so there is some confusion that we need to unravel. Um, and um, you've seen his bio in your pamphlets. He's, he is the professor of aesthetics and rhetoric. He's a director of the College of Pluralistic Judaism in Jerusalem, which is very close to his heart, which is a very important program in Israel. does not have a campus, but it really offers programs throughout the country to spread the world, word of pluralistic Judaism in many different venues and different seminars and schools. And um, I'm going to put a plug in for it and for other programs. Uh, in addition to supporting our causes here in this country, I found out at breakfast that the way we can as Americans support causes which are close to his heart or to Shulamit's heart are through the New Israel Fund. And they can give you the tax you know, benefit that you can't get by giving directly to his organization, but you can earmark money as you choose to any of these organizations which they believe in very strongly. Um, <coughs> but I wanted to say really more about Yaakov simply on a personal level, and because the bio is in front of you, it is something which strikes me as very important. When many of us travel to Europe, for vacation, or wherever we go. We like to go see Jewish sites. We got to go see the synagogue in whatever city it's in. So you go to Florence, you go see the beautiful Florence synagogue. You go to Berlin, you go to see the beautiful Neue synagogue that's still standing. You go to wherever it is, you may want to actually go and see a service there. We now have a chance in our movement to go to humanist congregations. And we don't have to just go to other places. So two years ago after the colloquium, Yaakov and Felice came back to New York and came to Yom Kippur services at the city congregation in New York. So that was their way of seeing us in action wherever we are. And so it's wonderful that we can do that and that you weren't just passing through, but this was close to his heart and that he decided to come and spend his high holiday with us. And we're happy that you're here now to spend this lecture with us. Now it works. <laughs> well, as all of you, I also learned a lot in uh, during this uh, colloquium. Uh, many things that we know. For instance, that uh, Judaism has many faces, and then we learned that it has many more faces than we thought. We learned that not only do the big religious, uh, main religious movements uh, have many splits in them, but even those religion or those religious movements that are outside of the uh, orthodoxy also have many faces. 
So Judaism is split not only because whenever there is a synagogue, you need another synagogue not to go to, <laughs> but Judaism is a pluralistic culture. And as a pluralistic culture, it has a pluralistic religion. And since most of Judaism today is not religious, it is a pluralistic, non-religious culture. The good news is, what I learned in this, in this colloquium, is that most of the various beliefs of the various groups have one thing in common. They are basically all atheists. This is news. Maybe news for them too. But this is true. Atheists. Because basically, atheism, though the word itself means the negation of theism, so it has a negative meaning, but atheism is a belief. Atheism is a belief that this world is not ruled by a personality called God, that there isn't such a thing in reality, which is God, that we human beings invented God, created God, shaped him, and we place him in our life and outside of our life. This is a common belief to pantheists like Spinoza, meaning those who identify nature with God, to deists like Voltaire, Namely, people who believe that maybe there is a God who created the world, but he has nothing to do with the world. He is separate from the world. He is not interfering in the world, and we don't interfere in his affairs. Or, straightforward atheists who dare to say, I believe in human beings as the center of my interests, as the creators of all deities and of all religions, and I believe that what is good for man is much more important than what is good for God. When we heard of the various variations of beliefs outside of orthodoxy here, this is the common denominator. All of them were looking for, prob for solutions not for God, but for the Jews, for human beings. So. Their common denominator is the faith in human beings being the center, the faith in humanism. One of the important historians of religion, Georges Minois from France, wrote now a big uh, history of atheism. And according to him, atheism preceded religion. According to him, there is enough research, enough evidence to prove today that in prehistoric times and some tribes that live still in this culture did not invent yet God. It reminds me of Groucho Marx who said that he knew Doris Day before she was a virgin. <laughs> We know, we know God before he existed. And in the 5th century BC, in India, they actually tried to develop a theory, not a religion, but a theory. The Buddha tried to establish his belief that man is more important than all the deities of India. The divinity is something that is inside the human being and also outside of the human being. It was an atheist theory, an atheist movement with many poems which are explicitly atheists. It was driven out of India it became a religion outside of India, 
and it is called Buddhism today. About the same time, in the Mediterranean, east of Mediterranean, a whole group of Greek philosophers, Thales, Democritus, Heraclitus, developed again an atheist theory. A theory according to which the world is eternal. And being eternal, it wasn't created. And it wasn't created by somebody or by somebody's. And therefore, the gods have no role in the creation of the world. Religion and establishment and political establishment went together. And they tried and succeeded to suppress most of atheistic movements in the world, but this doesn't mean that they succeeded in eradicating them. There were many, many atheistic movements and many atheistic thinkers in the world. We have the proof because so many were against them. Psalms calls them villains, the villain who said there is no God. So it means that the poet in Psalms knew people who say there is no God. Elisha ben Avuya was a Jew who realized after the Holocaust, after the Bar Kokhba the uprising, that there cannot be a God if these terrible things happen to people. Virgilius, in the Hellenistic time, was again an explicitly atheist poet. And Plato, the most totalitarian of all philosophers known to mankind, proposed to arrest all atheists, to put them in a concentration camp for five years, in the Book of Laws number 10. And if after five years, you do not succeed in convincing them that there is a God, execute them. So atheism was forbidden, was suppressed, not only by the religious establishment, not only by the political establishment, which executed Socrates on, uh, because they blamed him of atheism, Atheism was suppressed also by many philosophers, like Aplaton, like Plato, who were afraid of the freedom of human beings from God. So atheism lived an underground life. And up to the 17th, 18th century, it was mostly an underground life. And it was very unfortunate for humanity because religion became the overwhelming expression of its culture and religion doesn't have a sense of humor. Without a sense of humor, it's difficult to live, but it's also difficult to recognize reality. And therefore, when we say the Dark Ages about the Middle Ages, we may be mistaken because there were so many beautiful things created during the Dark Ages, but there is a grain of truth in what we are saying. Because the lack of a sense of humor, the absolute rule of the establishment and religion, the totalitarity of religion, of Catholic religion, Protestant religion, because not only Catholics burned people who were uh, <coughs> suspected in atheism. Calvin did the same thing, Protestant. The Inquisition in Spain not only harmed and killed so many people, not only Jews, whoever they suspect of atheism or of any other religion except for their own religion, but they destroyed the country. Lack of sense of humor means that you are not allowed to doubt the conventions. You are not allowed to doubt tradition. 
you are not allowed to criticize. And without criticizing, without understanding the other side, without knowing that reality has many sides, without realizing that reality is a developing process and not a situation, you get away from reality. And getting away from reality destroys society, destroys economy, and causes dark ages. Luckily, in the beginning of the 17th century, a new age starts. Under the influence of the Renaissance, which was actually limited to a very small elite of a few thousand people in Italy, but developed the basic ideas of humanism, in the 17th century, we already see the development of an atmosphere of freedom from religion. I prefer always to call secular Jews free Jews. Secular Judaism, free Judaism. Free from halakha, free from the belief in a personality that can command us and for whom we have to suffer. Free to believe in human beings and in their happiness, in their quality of life, in their pleasure as the superior value <coughs> according to which we can judge all morality, all laws, all regimes. This new principle of pleasure as a superior value was one of the most revolutionary principles which was introduced by the libertines in the beginning under the banner of free love, but which became one of the most important parts of the new belief in human beings. You judge your conduct not according to the suffering you are ready to suffer for God, but according to the pleasure you can gain by believing and developing life for men, for human beings. With the new beginning of the European culture, with works of Cervantes, of Shakespeare, later of Swift, of Moliere, sense of humor came back into European culture, into European literature, into European creation. And Jews, who were living in Western Europe mainly, mainly those who were living in Western Europe, who suffered more than others from the totalitarity of religion, these Jews joined very quickly the new trend in thinking and in culture that was based on humanism. When we speak about secular Jews, we always have to discern between secular Jews who are humanists and between secular Jews who are anti-humanists. Between secular people who are humanists and secular people who are anti-humanists. There are religions of the, the establishment of which was anti-humanist. But there are also secular regimes that were anti-humanist like the Bolshevik regime, like the Nazi regime. So the main difference, the main opposition, the main freedom that we gain by getting out of traditional religion is not by secularism, but by humanistic secularism, by humanistic freedom of the human being and putting him in the center and as the purpose of our thinking and thinking about his pleasure and his quality of life, his spiritual pleasure and his physical pleasure as the purpose of our human conduct. How does all this lead to an educational program 
or to thinking about Judaism. Doesn't that mean, as we heard yesterday, that cosmopolitan Jews or cosmopolitan human beings is the solution? If humanism is really the point of departure of the new culture, if humanism is the condition for happiness and pleasure, if humanism is the basis of all morality, of principles like the principle of Hillel, not to do to others what we hate being done to ourselves, this very simplistic principle, which is a genius formulation of all morality known to us. Because the Kantian principles that human beings can never be a tool, but always an aim, the Kantian principle that there can be no morality that is, that is uh, directed only to our family or to our society or to our nation, but morality is moral only if it's universal. All these principles correspond to the principle of Hillel, don't do to others what you hate being done to yourself. What you hate, but what you love, you can do to them, because this is pleasure. This is causing pleasure. So how do we go from these general principles of humanism to Judaism? I believe it's a very simple thing. Because there isn't such a thing as cosmopolitan people. They do not exist. It's a fiction. Human people are not born human. They are born with the potentiality of being human. The process of humanization of a human being as a child in a family, in society, in education is a process that can be realized only in a national culture, in a language, in a culture, in a tradition, in customs, in social behavior that is typical and unique and characteristic for this nation in which he was born, in which he grows up. You can, of course, live in more than one culture, in more than one national culture, like most Jews in the diaspora do. But you cannot live in a super cosmopolitan culture because such a culture doesn't exist. So we have to choose. If we want to be human, we have to choose our national culture. For us Israelis, growing up and being educated in a Jewish, Hebrew, Israeli national culture, there's no question of choice. There's a question only of standard. Would it be a culture only of entertainment? Would it be a culture only of physical pleasure? Would it be a culture only of immediate satisfaction? Or would it be a culture with deep values? Would it be a culture that can bring us also spiritual pleasure? Would it be a culture that raises us and makes us what we can be and not only what we are? But we live in a national culture. Our language is Hebrew. Our schools, day schools, are Hebrew schools, at least for most of our children. Some are still Yiddish speaking, but studying Hebrew and Aramaic in the Haredi schools, in the extreme Orthodox schools, but most kids go to Hebrew schools. We live in a world of Hebrew communication. We are exposed to Hebrew theater, to Hebrew radio, to Hebrew television, to Hebrew films, to a Hebrew society. We are living in a Jewish culture. Our problem is not what culture, what national culture we will live in, like for so many Jews in the diaspora, our problem is what kind of culture we will develop through our education and through our creation in Israel. Yesterday, 
We heard Shulamit Aloni, admired by me, like by all of you, comparing the vision of Israel to the reality of Israel. It reminded me of Voltaire, who lived in the 18th century with a woman by the name of Châtelet, who, because of her, he could escape the police, the French police, because he lived in her estate and he lived with her. And she told him once, why is history so boring? Why is it always kings and wars and kings and wars and laws and persecutions? Is that history? The question itself was enough for Voltaire and it convinced him to sit down and to write a big book. The book is on the century of Louis XIV and it was the first history book of a civilization and a culture, not only of kings, of wars, of laws, of persecution. Of course there are kings and wars and laws and persecution and discrimination and terrible things done to other people. But history is not only that. History is all the other aspects, all the other facets of the same society. When Zionism started to be realized, it was almost a joke. The Jewish people didn't want to go to Israel. Even when they were invited to Israel by the Balfour Declaration, like in the old days when Koresh invited them to come back from Babylon, they stayed in Babylon, they didn't go to Israel. Only about 3% of them came to Israel before the Second World War. But after the Second World War, when it was proven that Israel can survive, and not only by the accident that Rommel didn't win the war in El Alamein. All historians that speak about if and what would have happened if cannot research their if. We don't know what would have happened if Rommel entered Israel. We don't know if the Haganah plan of a guerrilla war wouldn't be as successful as Yugoslavia was. We don't know if Israel would really be cooperative with the Nazis as Hungary was, as Romania was, as France, as Italy was. We don't know what if, but we don't know what happened. But we do know what happened. What happened is that after the Second World War, after the Holocaust, in spite of the Holocaust, not as a result of the Holocaust, the Jewish nation, in Israel and with the help of others, developed a country in a very short time, only 100 years, it's not 50 years, it's 100 years, a country with a national language, with a flourishing culture, with six secular Jewish universities, with hundreds and hundreds of Jewish secular day schools. This is the biggest enterprise of secular Judaism. Secular Judaism, in spite of the religious and against the religious and against their messianic ideology, developed Israel. Terrible mistakes were done. Terrible betrayals of our leadership. Terrible discrimination was, is still existing against women, against Arabs. Terrible crimes are committed, like in all the wars, and we had six of them. But while all this was happening, we developed an unprecedented Jewish culture, Jewish secular culture in Israel. People are worried and are mainly aware of all the compromises our secular leaders have to do with the religious. And they should be worried and they should be aware. But 20 years ago, 
Tel Aviv was a closed city on Friday and Saturday. No coffee house was open, no restaurant was open, no theater, no cinema, nothing. Today it's an open city, like New York. Jerusalem has six cinemas open on Friday and Saturday. And the cinematic is open. And coffee houses are open in the streets and pubs are open and people are dancing in the streets on Friday night. Near the quarters of the extreme religious, Me'a Sharim. Jerusalem is not a dead city and Jerusalem is not ready to be given to the Haredim because we are the majority. We, the seculars, are still the majority. And we open the city. Secular culture in Israel is progressing. Most, almost all, writers, painters, musicians, <coughs> actors in theater, ac uh, creators of films, all of them are secular. It's a secular Jewish culture. So this is the great achievement of Israel in spite and besides all the terrible things that Shulamit Aloni described yesterday. Therefore, if we speak about the vision of this great journalist, Theodor Herzl, the man who thought of a simple solution to the Jews, let them be gathered in one place, in their own state, in order to rid the world of the problem of the Jews and to rid the Jews of the problem of the world, <coughs> Let them be separated from the world. It worked. Surprisingly, it worked. Today, the majority of youth under 18, of Jewish youth under 18 in the world, lives in Israel. In about 30 years, the majority of Jews will live in Israel. Israel has the highest birth rate in the West, Jews in the diaspora have the lowest birth rate in the West. This is the reason why demographic research shows that Israel is going to become the majority of the people, of the Jewish people, including intermarriage. Of course, including intermarriage. In the last five, six years, we absorbed a million new immigrants from former Russia, former Soviet Union. About 400,000 of them are not Jews according to the halakha, but close to 100% of their children are already Jews. Intermarriage within a Jewish society, within a strong, flourishing, developing, secular Jewish culture, adds to the Jewish people, doesn't diminish the Jewish people. So if somebody asks what's wrong with Zionism, I say nothing is wrong with Zionism. It succeeded, that's all. So why is there post-Zionism? Because it succeeded, that's all. <laughs> once you fulfill your purpose, once you reach your target, once you realize your dream, you stop dreaming. You have to do other things. You have to use your sense of humor. You have to criticize. You have to blame. You have to work with an opposition against any government who does any crime, Jewish or not Jewish. But you stop dreaming about the Zionist dream because the Zionist dream is not a dream anymore. And this was done by secular Judaism. Secular Judaism has many, many achievements had many, many achievements. One of the most important was the Yiddish culture and literature that was developed in Eastern Europe in one of the major <coughs> European languages. Secular Judaism developed Jewish culture or Jews developed in other Western cultures some of the most important works in the world in science, in literature, in theater, in entertainment, in music, in almost all fields. This was done by secular Judaism. Because secular Jews came from orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is the source 
of secular Jews. In the 19th century, most Jews were Orthodox or lived in Orthodox communities. During less than 100 years, over 90% of the Jews left the Orthodox communities and created the new creation in culture and created the most important, unprecedented historical event, the State of Israel as it is now. It is not only a country with five million Jews and a million Arabs. It is not only a democracy with all its flaws. All democracies have flaws, including the states. But it is a country in which there is an unprecedented number of people who go to the theater, who, go to mu who listen to music, who buy books. There are more Jewish books published in one month in Israel than Jewish books published in the whole world in two years. Therefore, my feeling is that what we have to do is not only to think about our troubles, but to think about our achievements, our achievements, the achievements of the secular Judaism. One of the achievements is the fact that atheism became the faith of almost all Jewries outside of orthodoxy. It has various formulations. We heard a wonderful formulation of Kaplan about the goodness of human being being God. But this, of course, is again a faith in the human being. It is not a faith in a God that lives somewhere and has a court with many uh, angels and concubines and, uh, and a wife and uh, sleeps with her and because in Jewish religion it exists, of course. It started to exist quite late, only in the 13th, 14th century. But then we added to God, because he was so lonely, we added to him a wife, uh, the Shekhinah. And uh, when she couldn't sleep with him, Lilith slept with him. And, uh, and we, in our uh, sexual intercourse, helped him to have his intercourse. <laughs> All this doesn't exist in a belief like the reconstructionist belief in the goodness of human being being God. Of course not. What's the difference between this and atheism? Atheism is not a denial. Atheism is a faith. It encompasses all other faiths of people who do not dare to say that they are atheists. <laughs> I believe I believe that we can and we have to face not only to our achievements, but also to our shortcomings. And we have shortcomings. One of the expressions of our shortcomings is this movement and will of so many young people who are not satisfied with their secular Judaism, they are secular, but who look for something called spirituality. Now, spirituality is a great word because it doesn't have an exact meaning. <laughs> spirituality, most words have more than one meaning, but this one doesn't have an exact meaning at all. <laughs> spirituality is another word for our spiritual life. And we have a spiritual life. <laughs> the Jewish philosopher Ernst Kassirer called it the life in symbols. He said human beings are different than other animals because they cannot live without symbols. They cannot communicate without symbols. They have a language which is made of symbols, of signs and symbols. But it's not only for communication that they need the symbols. They have to live in a world of symbols. Therefore, they dream. Therefore, they daydream. Therefore, they go to the theater. Therefore, they look at television or see movies. Therefore, they create poetry. 
Therefore, they are immersed in books, in novels, in stories, because they live in a world of symbols, besides using symbols for their daily life. Now, this life in a world of symbols is not done by our body. It is done by what we call spirit, by our capacity to live not only a physical life, but also a symbolic life. This capacity is unique to human beings and is being developed by human beings. And it can, it can be developed on various standards, on various levels. It can be as simple as a language for communication and practical purposes. It can be as high as the meeting of great works of art, of great poetry. Religion realized it. And therefore, all religion relies on art. There is no religion in the world that doesn't use poetry, painting, sculpture, theater. Because without art, they cannot create the symbolized world of the divinity. Divinity doesn't exist except in symbols. And the symbols become concrete if we live in art. One of the great shortcomings of the secular culture is that there is a separation between the art that we are creating and the community life that we are living. Our communities were disrupted by immigration, by other causes. And when we try to reconstruct a community, a secular Jewish community, we lack, we are short of enough works of art to make us, to elate us, to give us this feeling of elation that art can give, that I imagine that that's what they call spirituality. The entrance into the world of symbols can be done by simple phrases, by logical phrases, by right phrases. But it can also be done by great poetry, like the Psalms, like Job, like Ecclesiastes, like Amichai, like Alterman, like Itzik Manger, like Leivik like Ira Gershwin. Unless we will find a way of incorporating great art, great poetry into our community life, we will not give an answer to people who are looking for living in a world of symbols and not only using symbols for their daily life. Which means that the will for spirituality is not a strange, it's not an aberration. It is something very natural, something that belongs to all cultures and belongs also and should belong also to the secular culture. What are poems? What is great poetry? We do not have the answer. The English philosopher Clive Bell said, the answer to the question, what is poetry, is a poem. When you read a poem and you recognize that this is real poetry, and there are poets among us who know it, then it's poetry. But not using poetry, not using the great treasure of Jewish poetry that started to develop already in the Bible and is developing till today, is a mistake. Because this is another great achievement of secular culture. We could shed a new light on all the treasures of Jewish literature, of Jewish thought, mainly on the Bible. Somebody said in this colloquium, nothing changes as the past, nothing changes as the Bible. <laughs> The Bible changed co all the time, from the beginning. And in our time, it changed even more than in the past. 
Not only did the Midrash and the Talmud change the Bible against the will of the establishment of the Sadducees, not only did the Kabbalah change the Bible completely by ignoring the contents and using only the words and sometimes even only the letters, but even today, and beginning with Spinoza, who is the starting point of all secular culture, all secular beliefs, all atheism, and of the new approach to the Bible, we are seeing the Bible in a new light. Therefore, I'm sometimes amazed when people are following the tradition of reading the Bible as was read in the tradition. For instance, saying that Eve in Judaism is the mother of sin is a nice Augustine Christian saying it has nothing to do with the Bible. Saying that it's sure that a man wrote it and not a woman without any evidence. As Harold Bloom says, the reason I believe that women wrote so much of the Bible and nobody can disprove me because nobody can prove that a man wrote all these works in the Bible. But the story of Eve is one of the stories that can show us how we change our attitude. Eve is the great heroine of knowledge, of culture, of civilization. When this God created the world according to the story, and somebody who wrote it didn't like him very much, because he immediately thought that he committed the original sin. The original sin of God was to forbid human beings of knowing. And without knowing, there is no culture, there is no civilization, there is no development. Without knowing, you are like animals living in the primordial forest of Gan Eden. But there was, and this was the only law existing. Therefore, it's such a terrible sin of God against humanity. He created humanity with the potential of knowing, but he forbid the knowing. But his great mistake was that he relied on men. Man was satisfied. Why not? I mean, he had enough to eat. He, uh, the forest gave him whatever he wanted, like in the prehistoric time. And he, so there is a law, so it's a terrible law, so what? <laughs> she didn't like it. <laughs> she met a creature, which we call now serpent, but there it's called the one who can divine. Nachash. He is the one who knows the future. When she told him, yes, but I cannot eat from this fruit because this is the fruit of knowledge, and God said that you die from the fruit of knowledge, he said, you don't die. <laughs> I mean, so he said, so he lied, so what? <laughs> Eating from the fruit of knowledge makes you knowable, not dead. Therefore, eat from it. And she looked at it, and she said that it was so beautiful. I cannot translate it into English. It is pretty to become knowledgeable. Haskalah, enlightenment. She saw how beautiful it is and how meaningful it is to know. And like Prometheus in Greek mythology, she endangered her life in order to bring to human beings knowledge, and she did. And because man thought that he can throw the blame on her, he ate. Now, of course God got terribly mad. <laughs> of course we are speaking about the patriarchal society in which the God of this society tries to rule by himself 
And when somebody rebels against him and succeed, and she succeeded, he tries to be as cruel as Zeus was to Prometheus. And then comes the wonderful formulation of the real socio-biological tragedy of women in a patriarchal world, the curse of God. This is a formulation of how women are suppressed in such a society, how men can rule them, how they love him in spite of the fact that he rules them, and because of their love he can rule them. This, Harold Bloom says, could be written only by a woman. Nobody could formulate it in such a precise way, in such a, to make such a summary of the terrible destiny of women in a patriarchal society. Because of their spent women. Now this kind... <laughs> This kind, <laughs> this kind of reading is only one kind of reading. We heard yesterday different kinds of reading. <laughs> I, of course, think that my way of reading is the right one. <laughs> but the fact that we can read it in so many ways, this is the difference. And therefore, the great achievement of our secular culture is that we could change all the sources of Judaism and we can use them in a new way. It'll be foolish not to use them. It'll be foolish to use only those works that were created in the last 200 years, only all those works that don't mention God. Therefore, I believe that what we can do and we should do is to emulate what is happening here in this building, in this movement. It's not enough to educate. We have to create communities. It's not enough to prepare teachers. We have to prepare teachers of people, what Buber called more am. People who are open to the sources and the treasures of poetry and culture who can give an answer to our spiritual needs, not in the sense of a all overwhelming organism that thrives and palpitates and we are its cells, <coughs> but in the real sense of spirituality, in the sense of having the experience of symbols created by men, of a world of symbols created by men that can elate us within our national culture and from it in the international culture. This can be done. <coughs> beginnings are there. One of the most important beginnings is this movement here. I want to conclude not with a commercial for the books I wrote because I wrote them in Hebrew and they're out of print. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to conclude with a commercial for the Institute which Rabbi Sherwin Wine and myself are heading, the Institute for Secular Humanistic Judaism, which inspires two, I think, very important institutions, though they are only in the beginning. The Institute here in Detroit, which prepares Madrichim, Morei Am, and Rabbanim for the secular movement, which can lead communities which can help communities develop their own culture and the sister organization in Israel which helped develop the College of Pluralistic Judaism which tries to work in schools in Israel in order to reorientate the teachers toward a positive way of secular Judaism to understand Judaism from a humanistic, secular point of view, to create a new discipline, the discipline of Judaism as culture. I know that we are very small. I know that you can count us, the people who are engaged in it full time, 
maybe 